Welcome to Chat with the Lawyer, and I'm your host, Walla Blagay. And today we are honored to have Delegate Aisha Brave Boy from the 25th Legislative District. And in fact, we are sitting in the 25th Legislative District in the city of District Heights. I want to note that Delegate Brave Boy actually recently ran for Attorney General in the last primary, and we are very honored to have her here today. She's going to talk about foreclosure issues, economic justice issues, among others. So, Delegate Brave Boy, tell us how you started into politics. Well, I started um, by working in local government, and about, uh, I guess, eight years ago now, I ran for delegate for the first time, and I was excited when I won and served for my first four years and decided to serve again for another four. Um, it's been a great experience, um, but I knew that um, my vision, I think, for, for myself, my career, and the things I wanted to do was, you know, outside really of the scope of responsibilities as a state delegate. Mm. So I ran for a higher office, I ran for attorney general. To you. Thank you, thank you. And um, do you serve, what's committees do you serve on? And well, I, my primary committee is the House Economic Matters Committee, mm -hmm. and we deal with business regulation. Uh, I actually chair the Consumer Protection and Commercial Law uh, Committee, mm -hmm. and um, I also serve on big business regulations and banking and finance. That's interesting. Now, I know during your attorney general race, there were some economic justice issues that you pushed and advocate for. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, sure. You know, one of the tragedies that has occurred is that insurance companies are trying to gain the system um, when it comes to the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. um, the state's largest service provider, Care First, proposed a few years ago a 25% rate increase and they were actually granted about a 15% rate increase by the Maryland Insurance Administration. Mm -hmm. Last year, they filed for another wow. rate that increase. Much. <laughs> and, and so, you know, we have to be vigilant in protecting our consumers. Obviously, we want everyone to be insured. That's why most of us supported the Affordable Care Act, but that was not designed really to make and bankroll insurance companies. It was designed to help consumers. Right. Right, interesting. Did you work on um, the minimum wage issue? Well, of course, as you know, I was the chief primary sponsor of a oh, bill okay. that to, to raise the minimum wage. Um, it was a bill that I had put in um, twice before, okay. so I was really excited that we were able to raise the minimum right. wage this year. But there are many other wage issues that go on that we still have to deal with. I mean, even though we did raise the minimum wage, we really didn't um, set a progressive, uh, you know, uh, ceiling for our um, tipped workers who are, who are more likely, yeah. number one, to be women, yeah. <laughs> and number two, um, to um, wind up in poverty. Mm -hmm. Because, um, because uh, you know, tip workers typically don't work a regular 40 hour week. Okay. And so because they're, 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 um, the amount that they earn depends upon when they're called in and how many hours they get, right. um, it puts them in a really tough position. Mm -hmm. And those minimum wage earners aren't just taking care of themselves, right. they're raising families. Yeah, exactly. So this is something that we have to address and I, I look forward to seeing the General Assembly address in the next session. Um, we still here in Maryland have a gap between mm -hmm. what we pay men and women for the mm -hmm. same jobs. So we have wage disparities there. Um, and then we also have to look at providing our workers with you know, some minimal um, opportunities to take care of themselves, like providing sick leave. Right. You know, Because right. a lot of the mm -hmm. folks who um, don't get sick leave are, are in the food services industry. Right. And so right. you don't want sick workers preparing your food. Right. But they have to choose between being able to pay rent maybe being able to afford childcare right. and uh, you know coming into work when they're when they're feeling bad so it's a good point good point now let's segue into the foreclosure issue sure. now that has been a big issue in Prince George's County I oh, mean it's yeah. been <laughs> massive um, one of the this is county has one of the highest foreclosures in the country yes. so um, let's talk about the steps in foreclosure process sure well let me just say that you know about 
seven years ago, uh, former Chief Judge Bell asked all the attorneys in the state of Maryland to step up to serve you know, clients on a pro bono basis so that these families here in Maryland can, can save their homes. Mm -hmm. And I was one of those attorneys that stepped up and got trained as a pro bono attorney and I served many families and it's just been just a, such an honor to mm -hmm. just um, be able to keep you know, families intact Right. to keep children in the same schools they're used to. I mean, mm -hmm. these are the real life issues that happen when you go through a foreclosure process. But, um, you know, the first step really, you know, the first person that knows that a foreclosure might occur is actually the borrower, the homeowner. Right. Because the borrower knows whether or not they're able to meet their monthly ob obligations. Right. Right. And so what I say to borrowers is if you know that you're not going to be able to meet your monthly obligation, instead of waiting for the bank to send you a notice of intent to file foreclosure or move along those judicial lines, right. contact your lender. Right. Let them know that you're facing an economic hardship. Um, many lenders have programs where they allow for a forbearance period. Oh, interesting. So, it's better to do that prior to the legal process coming into effect because then it's, it's a little bit more difficult. More lawyers are involved. You've got the lawyers representing the banks that are involved. And so it's a little bit more difficult to stop the train once it starts moving. But if you can get in touch with your bank when you know that you're going to uh, not meet your, your obligation, that's the best time to, to have some options. Um, but let's say you didn't do that and, right. and the bank sends a notice. The bank has to send you a notice of intent to file foreclosure mm -hmm. um, 45 days after the default. Mm -hmm. okay? okay? So 45 days after the default, um, you'll get a letter okay. stating that you are in default. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, lender has to provide you with the information for the investor okay. and your loan servicer. Okay. Also the amount of the default and because of the laws that we uh, enacted in the recent years, right. the uh, lender also has to provide you with an application for loss mitigation. Mm. So that could be a loan modification potentially, right. or short sale, or deed into a foreclosure, or maybe a, a, um, some type of forbearance period or something like that. Now, how does someone know which options to consider? Like whether they should do short sale, you know, foreclosure, sure. like how, how would they? Well, if they want to keep their home, then, right. you know, the best thing to do is try to do a loan modification. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the loan modification typically comes in the form of, of maybe an interest rate reduction. Okay. Um, many loans that were, let's say, uh, someone um, got a loan back in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. um, the rates then were probably six to seven percent. Mm -hmm. Now you can get a loan for four and a quarter, four and a half. Mm -hmm. And so you, so now um, lenders can offer better rates mm -hmm. that would bring down your, um, your monthly payments. Mm -hmm. um, also, if you're able to meet your monthly obligation, but you just um, weren't able to meet it that month, maybe something catastrophic happened, mm -hmm. you had a health issue, whatever, mm -hmm. then you can ask for a forbearance so that you can miss that month and they typically will tack that amount onto the end of your loan. I got you. So you don't have to pay double the payment the next month. Right. Okay. Because right. most, most people most can't people do can't that, do that. Okay. can't afford it. And really, I think it's in the bank's best interest and obviously in the homeowner's best interest to ensure that they can actually make the payment that they're obligating themselves to. So they don't want to get in a situation where they're worse off than they were before. Okay. 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 Well, then, um, so what's next? Now, let's go back. You mentioned something at the beginning about calling your, your bank. Have you found in your practice that many pe banks are receptive? Or are there some that are like, no, absolutely not? Yeah, no, they're typically receptive, especially if they have not yet filed the notice of intent. Again, that gives you the, the most options. The lawyers are not involved. The loss mitigation department's not involved yet. You're just at that point where you're trying to just figure out if you can come to some terms, some agreement with your lender. I think that's the best 
um, the best strategy. And it's empowering for homeowners because they're just not waiting to be foreclosed upon, um, but they can actively and proactively do something about it. Mm -hmm. um, but after the 45 days, and as I mentioned, the, the bank has to provide certain information, mm -hmm. um, then the the application for modification um, is is given to the home uh, homeowner, mm -hmm. and the important thing is to fill that out immediately. You want to get that filled out immediately, and the good news here in Maryland is that if you don't feel comfortable filling it out yourself, you have uh, a number of um, attorneys um, who will assist you uh, free of charge. In addition to that, we have a number of housing counselors who will assist you free of charge. So, Where are they? Like, how do we get to these? They're places? located all around the state. The best thing to do is to go on to the Office of the Attorney General's website. Okay. And, um, and, and it'll pr provide you with all the links you need to find um, housing counselors or attorneys in your area. Okay, that's good mm -hmm. to know. So now you've decided whether you want foreclosure or a short sale, so what's next? Well, you, you apply. Okay. And then the bank has to evaluate your application to determine whether or not you um, meet the criteria for one of their loss mitigation you know, right. tools. So um, once that happens, um, and that can happen within the 45-day the period, mm -hmm. um, the next 45-day period. So you have the 45-day period um, that they have to wait in order to file a notice of intent. Mm -hmm. And then they actually have to wait yet another 45 days mm -hmm. um, after the default. So the, mm -hmm. once the default occurs, technically they have 90 days before they can file a, uh, a docket to order. Okay. Okay? okay. So the first 45 days, they're, you know, sending you this notice of intent. And in that second part of that 90 day period, the next 45 days, um, they are, you know, perhaps evaluating your application package if you sent one in. If you mm -hmm. didn't send one in, I mean, it gets tough. So I tell That's people to just wow. really be vigilant about it um, because after 90 days, they can file that um, order to docket. And what that does is it starts the judicial time clock ticking okay. um, in order to set a, a sale date, which you, we, we don't want to get to. <laughs> right. um, but that um, order to docket has to, the lender has to state and has to file an aff affidavit stating that they are, um, that they have the right to foreclose on your property. So they have to show that they are the proper holder of the note for your property. Mm -hmm. um, they have to provide um, details on the amounts that are owed. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, they have to file an affidavit stating that they provided the borrower with a, an application for loss mitigation. And either they, the, they're still in process okay. or um, they've denied the, the, the individual. And if they've denied the individual, um, then they have to tell the court why. So all of that information is in that um, notice to die. All right, what helpful information. Um, so we're gonna take a short break and we will be right back and I'm sure you wanna hear more. So stay tuned. AmeriCorps Hero. I'm an AmeriCorps member now. My service gear. I look sharp. I wanna help people. I wanna make a difference. I wanna get things done. You can be a hero too. Join AmeriCorps. Welcome back to Chat with the Lawyer, and I'm your host, Walla Blagay. And I was talking with Delegate Brave Boy about foreclosure issues. And we, the last time we talked, we talked about putting the application in. You filed your application, then there's a, a, a notice that goes out. So, so, so after your application, well, there's the so the the notice of intent, notice of intent. and then that goes out 45 days after the default, right. and then there's the order to docket that's 90 days after the default, and that order has to um, include a number of things, including an affidavit stating that the borrower, sorry, that the lender offered the borrower an application for loss mitigation. If the borrower completes it, and if they've already, com if the bank has already completed their review of it and made a determination of whether or not they qualify, then they have to provide that information to the court as well. If the borrower does not qualify for a loss mitigation, at that stage, the, um, the, uh, the uh, lender has to provide what's called a, a final uh, affidavit notifying the court that the borrower did not qualify. Mm -hmm. And at that stage, the borrower can then request 
uh, uh, med med uh, excuse me, mediation. And, and so mediation has to be requested uh, within 25 days after the um, final affidavit is mailed. So that's really important too. So really if borrowers who want to, you know, um, uh, mediate with their lender, ha have another opportunity to do that. They can be represented right, by a pro bono that. attorney. Okay. They can be represented by a housing counselor. Okay. So there's another opportunity, hopefully, for the parties to come to some resolution. Um, and so there's a fifty dollar fee mm -hmm. that the borrower has to pay, okay. and they submit that to the Office of Administrative Hearings. And that is scheduled within 30 to 60 days um, after um, the, the application is for mediation is received. And just clarify, when mm -hmm. you get your pro bono attorney for your mediation, you're going through the, the Office of Attorney General, right? No, you don't go through the Office of the Attorney General, but the Office of the Attorney General has partnerships with um, many pro bono um, attorneys around the state, including the Pro Bono Resource Center of Maryland, oh, and right. yeah, okay. Okay. so so they'll refer you okay. to an attorney. Absolutely, oh, that's good to know. Okay, so now after the mediation, what's next? If you don't do mediation, you <laughs> well, you can opt not to do mediation, and if you don't do mediation, thirty days after the. Um, the uh, final affidavit is filed, then the borrower, uh, sorry, the lender can schedule a foreclosure date. Um, mm -hmm. They have to advertise it, obviously, but they can schedule it. If you opt for mediation and you wait 30 to 60 days and try to work it out, if it doesn't work out, then 15 days after that uh, the meeting, the mediation meeting, if it doesn't work out, then the, the, uh, the lender can file uh, or t can request a, a, a foreclosure date sale date. Mm -hmm. um, once the sale occurs, and of course the, the borrower gets notice of when the sale is going to be and all of that, so there's all this notice that's required, mm -hmm. um, but once the sale is done, um, then uh, there's a, a period where the borrower can file what's called exceptions to the sale, and typically mm -hmm. um, the exceptions are very narrow in scope. Um, um, typically, the borrower is saying that there were certain steps that the lender was supposed to take that the lender did not take. Mm -hmm. that, okay. th th those are the, really the, the only things that it, at that stage could prevent um, a final ratification of that foreclosure sale. Okay. Um, but there's one other strategy that a lot of um, borrowers use because a lot of people are waiting to the very last minute or they don't make their filings on time and they're stressed and stretched. Um, many borrowers um, then decide, and they cannot to do this, which is to file for uh, bankruptcy. And that will stay a foreclosure sale um, during that, the bankruptcy period. And you can file that bankruptcy all the way up until the sale occurs. So some borrowers will file the morning of, the day of, as long as notice is given to the lender. Um, then the lender will know that that sale cannot take place. So um, and you would have to send notification, right? Just to clarify, you can, if you file bankruptcy, they don't really know. They wouldn't necessarily, yeah, they wouldn't know. So you have to put them on notice. Okay. Um, but that can just be a call to the bankruptcy, I'm sorry, the, the, the attorney that's handling the foreclosure sale. Okay. Um, or if, let's say, you know, you, you file at the last minute, mm -hmm. you or your attorney can run down to the courthouse steps okay. <laughs> and say, here, here's the um, bankruptcy filing, and then okay. they'll have to take that, um, that out. Yeah. Oh, nice. All right. Well, then, um, so it's good. Now we know the whole process. Now, there are HOAs can also... Um, HOAs and other condo fees, what, what if you're delinquent on those? So yeah, so one of the things that homeowners need to know, especially if they live in a, a common, what's called a common ownership community, a condo association or a homeowners association, is that they are obligated by contract to pay their assessments. And if they don't pay those assessments, um, the hammer that the, um, that the association has is the ability to file what's called a lien document. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, and they have to provide, obviously, notice of intent to file a lien to the homeowner prior to making any judicial filings. They file that notice, or they send a notice um, of intent to file a lien, mm -hmm. and then the um, and and, and the uh, the homeowner or unit owner is notified that they have you know 30 days to respond or to request a hearing. Mm -hmm. And so um, typically, people wait. 
and they don't do it. And, that, and they get in a situation where they end up having a lien against them and they're like, wait a minute, I don't owe that or I dispute that amount, but they didn't respond. So they've got to respond. It's really important to request a mm -hmm. hearing and then they can come um, before a judge and make um, arguments obviously on both sides but um, dispute the amount maybe that's owed or, or whatever, or make some you know, other overtures. Because a lot of times the HOA or the condo association is not really trying to take the property. Mm -hmm. What they want is for the assessments to be paid. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the, the way that they encourage the, the owners to, to make, meet their obligations. Um, so once the notice, notice is filed, a hearing is held at the request of the um, of the homeowner or unit owner, um, if the judge if the judge determines that the homeowners association is well within their rights to file this lien and the amount is fine, then a lien can be created. Um, and then um, I think it's like within two years the uh, association can foreclose on that lien, but they have to go through the um, same process as the. Um, the um, l lender and that, okay. that the uh, mortgage note holder would ha have to go through in order to foreclose on the property. So there's notice requirements, there's advertising, there's um, a right actually of redemption uh, for the um, for, for the, the owners, homeowners. Um, but it's so important, again, just to communicate. Because even with homeowners associations and condo associations, many times they'll set up payment plans mm -hmm. um, with the, the unit owners. Because in this day and age, as you know, with all the right. foreclosures going on in our county um, and around the state, um, the likelihood that there's a whole lot of equity in some of these homes that right. have liens against them is slim to none. So right. it's really in the best interest of both parties to work it out and if they can work it out great so um, but but yeah but but homeowners have to understand that they have responsibilities and there are severe consequences if they don't meet their financial obligations Now you mentioned that they file a notice and then there is um, a hearing schedule now of course we know hearings can be sometimes burdensome long what about mediation as in the other process? Could they opt for mediation at that point to, because a lot of times the homeowner assessment for the homeowner association is a lot less than what they owe for their, um, for your mortgage. So oh, absolutely. So it, it could be something you could just really do mediation and actually yeah. just agree with the payment plan for yeah. something smaller. So, so typically, typically, not every single association, but typically associations aren't nickeling and diming their, their, the unit owners because it actually is not financially feasible for them to do it because they have to hire attorneys and go through that the court filings and the process. Mm -hmm. So it's really, um, many times it's after maybe uh, months or maybe even sometimes years after mm -hmm. um, not being able to come to a resolution or the homeowner not being uh, responsive to letters and notices. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you don't necessarily see three or four or five hundred dollar liens typically. Sometimes you might. It has to be excessive. It doesn't have to be, but typically it is because that's when it makes sense for them to, to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they could potentially write it off as a loss or, you know, something like that. Interesting. Okay. And what organizations, let's just go back over this, sure. someone contact if they're looking at this problem now and they're thinking maybe I should contact someone to get the process started? Well, if you are facing foreclosure, um, there are attorneys around the state, again, who have been trained to assist homeowners on a pro bono basis. Mm -hmm. So what I would suggest doing is going on the Office of the Attorney General's website. That's the Maryland Office of the Attorney General's mm -hmm. website. Mm -hmm. And um, following their links to you know, loss mitigation or home preservation, and it'll provide you with all of the, the resources that are available for free for homeowners. Okay. Okay. Um, when it comes to, um, you know, homeowners that have an issue with their homeowners association or condo association, we don't have sort of a, a statewide, you know, strategy for that, mm -hmm. but they can call their local um, bar associations mm -hmm. or uh, the pro bono bar, mm -hmm. and they may be able to, or legal aid, as you, okay. I'm sure you're familiar okay, with, yeah. and they may be able to assess, uh, assist, excuse me, especially low income right. um, individuals. Um, and if not, they just have to go and hire an attorney yeah. to represent them. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That, that's, that's interesting. Now, is it, well, what about renters here? Do they have any rights here? Well, you know, the 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 
the, the people who kind of are, are totally blindsided in this whole foreclosure process is typically the renter, right. whether it's whether it's um, a, an individual who's being foreclosed upon because they're not paying their mortgage or because um, their property is potentially in some stage of foreclosure because they're not, because they are renting their home and they live in a homeowners association and they're not paying their assessments. Mm -hmm. um, typically, the, the, the individual living in the home has absolutely no idea until they get a notice that they no longer, um, that their landlord no longer <laughs> owns the property. But there are protections built into federal law um, for renters. And so renters, um, t so, so the, the person acquiring the note, whether it's the bank or whatever, the, ha has to meet really the obligations of, or stands in the place, right, of the landlord. And so the rights that the renter has under their lease agreement should be honored by the, by the, the note holder. Mm -hmm. So typically that happens. Um, but if the note holder really wants that property immediately or in a shorter time frame, they ha at least have to give them 90 days notice. Um, so that they can make other arrangements. But, but what we're finding right now is that a lot of the lenders understand it takes a while to get the properties ready to be on the market anyway. Right. And so um, the, the uh, tenants' rights are protected. Interesting. Okay. So um, I know that there is tenants' rights. They would and, have to and, go and, to and court, it, though, yeah, right? And that was, it, no, no, they don't have to go to court for this. This is, this is, this is law that the, the, that the, uh, that the, um, the the person acquiring or the entity acquiring the note has to um, provide the same you know opportunity for them to live in the home and and have the same rights as a, a, a tenant that they had under the original lease. Right. Okay. So yeah, um, if they believe that their rights are being violated, obviously they can go to landlord and tenant court. But mm -hmm. but but typically, you know, I think everyone kind of knows what the, the you know what the deal is, and yeah. you know, so people know what the rules are and they're living by the rules. Um, but it, it is unfortunate for a lot of tenants, and they get kind of blindsided. But, you know, that's why we built in those protections. That's good to know, good to know. Now, let's go back to the legislative stuff. Now, we sure. know that you were head of the Black Caucus. Yes. And talk to us a little bit about some of the things that the Black Caucus worked on. Well, one of our main priorities under my leadership was um, obviously the preservation of our historically black colleges and universities. We have four in our state, um, a coalition representing their interests actually filed a lawsuit against the state of Maryland back in 2006. Okay. And um, that case was not completely resolved, but a, a decision was rendered um, last October and essentially it found that the state of Maryland violated both the Equal Protection Clause and um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, mm. and that the state was running was considered a dual system of higher education um, and really precluding true integration um, on historically black colleges and university campuses um, by duplicating programs. So if you had a, a great program that's like working at an HBCU, for instance, Morgan State's MBA program was really the only one in the region, was doing well, attracting a diverse student body, um, but instead of allowing that um, program to grow and flourish, the state decided to allow the uh, Towson State University and the University of Baltimore to create a competing program, uh, MBA program. And what that had the effect of doing was reducing not only the number of students um, at Morgan's program, but also the number of diverse students at Morgan's program. And so, you know, we, you know, in, in this state, regardless of your color, we want you to feel comfortable coming to any of our institutions understanding and knowing that you'll get a quality education. And so it's so important that we treat our historically black college and universities the way in which we treat any other university in our state. Well, thank you, Dr. Thank Dr. you. For this great information here. Thank and you, it was you know, awesome. Many homeowners will be very happy to hear this. And we're gonna have to have you come back on and talk about some of your legislative initiatives. Well, thank you, I'd love that. All right. All right. All right. Well, stay tuned. If you have any questions, email us at chatwiththelawyer at gmail.com or contact us at www.wallablegay.com. Thank you.